To continue where I left off in looking at USS Lexington, we will now look at another similar wreck. This time USS Hornet CV-8, a ship that took an incredible amount of pounding to send down, and a ship that is incredibly well preserved in the modern day. So well preserved that I would feel comfortable in saying she's endured her 81 years, 77 at time of discovery, underwater better than a lot of newer ships. Much as with Lexington, I will look at Hornet on her own in this video. Her wreck provides enough material to have a dedicated video. In the future, I will give USS Wasp the same treatment to round out this trio of American aircraft carrier wrecks. For now though, back to Hornet. She was discovered in January 2019 by the intrepid RV Petrol and Vulcan Inc. at a depth of 5,300 meters, or roughly 17,500 feet. This discovery was another notch on the belt of veteran shipwreck hunters, who had found quite a few important wrecks to that point, and would find several more later on. These men deserve all the credit and praise they get for their efforts. In this case, to describe what was noted at the time, they used data from archives, including deck logs and sightings from nine other warships. That was just to plot a general area, as no one knew exactly where Hornet drifted to before finally sinking. And yet, they found her on the first dive. When you're talking about finding a needle in a very deep haystack like this, that is incredible. As for the actual wreck itself, the first thing to note with Hornet's wreck is that she is in much better condition than Lexington. Hornet still ended up in two pieces on the bottom, but only her stern section broke off. This is in stark contrast to Lexington, which ended up in three major pieces. Four if you count her island as a distinct piece. Just from the sonar images showing this, you can infer that Hornet did not suffer the same kind of internal explosions that Lexington did. More likely, her stern was weakened by the damage she took, especially the multiple American and Japanese torpedoes that hit her. This damage weakened it enough to snap off at some point after she went under. According to the sonar image on screen now, Hornet's main hull section is about 205 meters, or 672 feet, long. Hornet, when she was intact, was a ship of 251 meters, 825 feet in length. That means she's missing about 46 meters, about 150 feet, of her stern. That section of stern rests about a nautical mile away from the main hull, with the signal bridge resting a bit further off the stern section. The last things I'll note from the sonar are the F4F Wildcat found on it, which I'll get to later, and the fact you can see where Hornet initially impacted the bottom before she slid a bit and came to a stop. The impact she left is quite visible, actually. With that done, we can now move to the pictures of the wreck itself, which are fascinating for the level of preservation. If you've been watching these videos and were impressed at the level of preservation on Lexington, or Hornet's own sister Yorktown for that matter, Hornet has her own time to shine here. First off, her paint. You can see the flat colors on her superstructure and gun tubs, which is in line with Lexington or Yorktown. On Hornet, however, you can go further down and see the camouflage pattern on her main hull. Furthermore, the pattern on some of her 5-inch gun positions is also visible as well as her number 8, which remains perfectly legible. Even her signal bridge, which broke off from the rest of the island and is alone on the seabed, still has a visible distinction in her paint scheme. As does the island itself, which is admittedly more interesting for the distinctly rounded shape of it in comparison to her older sisters. That is one of the distinctions of Hornet's design from her relatively late construction, and it is nice to see it intact so many years later. Even the signal horn, resting in its mount atop her tower, remains firmly in place, paint and all. Unfortunately, you can't see much more in the way of hull paint. One of the quirks of Hornet's wreck is how deeply buried she is in the silt and mud of the seafloor. This is probably not terribly surprising when you look at the sonar and see how she slid after her initial impact. It remains notable, however, that Hornet is, in places, buried all the way up to her hangar deck. That leaves a lot of detail, especially the torpedo damage, underneath the mud, which is a shame from an archaeological perspective. 
there is some damage visible, shown on screen here, though if that's torpedo damage, or from the impact with the seabed, isn't immediately clear. Nonetheless, what is visible remains interesting. As is typical with these American shipwrecks, her guns remain largely in place and well-preserved. Though in Hornet's case, at least one of her 20mm mounts has a bent barrel. This one is, apparently, the only picture of her stern section that I've been able to find. Or at least the only picture I've seen confirmed as her stern section. That aside, more of the 20mm cannon are intact on other parts of the hull, though pointing almost straight up. As a whole, though, the guns look almost like they did when she sank, just rusty and covered in muck, regardless of if they were 20mm or 5-inch weapons. Their barrels still point skywards, and at least in one case, a projectile remains in place in the fuse setter by its gun. What is really interesting about Hornet's wreck in comparison to the others here is that during the initial press release, a veteran of the ship was interviewed. Richard Nowatsky, 95 years old at the time, was put in touch with Petrol and shown his 5-inch gun towards the stern, right in front of where she broke, in fact. It's quite something, and I'll link the CBS article and video in the description, to see a man reunited with his ship after so many years. He was thankful to Petrol for honoring him and his shipmates by finding Hornet's wreck. And he had the good humor to joke that, if they found his locker, they could have the $40 he left inside it. Considering the level of preservation around some of these guns, including intact ladders and the like, that may be less of a joke than it seems. At least the locker part. For another example, and this is one of the more striking images of the wreck, there's a bulkhead with a coat caught in it. Not only does this make one wonder how that happened, but the coat looks like you could pull it out, give it a good cleaning, and it would be perfectly wearable. After 77 years underwater, at the time the picture was taken. Then there's her 5-inch gun director, which still points to the side, likely where it was last in use. While the top is a bit torn up, it remains largely intact, down to the hatches on its front, some of which are more open than others, which is either a result of the combat or the sinking. This is similar to USS Johnston's wreck, where you can see her 5-inch gun director with an equivalent level of preservation. Moving past that into Hornet's flight deck, that's lacking a bit in pictures, though what we have shows it to still be largely intact, with visible bomb damage at that. Now, before I move on to the break in her hull, one last picture. This is listed as the first station on her deck, and shows some of the more visible damage to her hull both slumping in the station itself and torn metal resting atop it. While not the most visually important part of her wreck, I find it interesting for that mix of damage. That said, with that out of the way, the break in her hull. We have better pics of this in comparison to Lexington's wreck, which didn't have good angles on the hull breaks. The first of the two pictures is the one of Nowatsky's 5-inch gun. This was described by the man himself, as the farthest one aft, and you can clearly see the break in her hull here. Her flight deck is torn and twisted before falling off into the darkness. You can see Hornet's frames, as well as ruined debris pushing in towards the 5-inch mount itself. And yet, for all of that damage, the gun mount itself still has its paint and is largely intact. That is the starboard side of the break. The port side of the break is rather less pretty. Here you can still see her paint, camouflage and all, but the hull is visibly broken and torn apart by the force of the split. Whatever caused Hornet to break in two, it was quite violent, even if not to the same extent as Lexington. Her plating is torn and folded back over the rest of her hull, with more split and twisted further in. The second picture does a good job of demonstrating just how violent her break really was. You can even see some of the violence of the break on her sonar images, for that matter. Past that break, though, there are only a couple more major things to note on her hull itself. Moving from the break in her stern to her extreme bow, you can see two interesting things here. First, the forwardmost weapon on Hornet, in the form of a quad 1.1-inch mount beneath her flight deck. This mount is incredibly well-preserved, from both the paint to the condition of the weapon itself. 
There are a couple other quad 1.1 inch mounts that had pictures taken, as shown here, where hoses still retain their red coloration. As for her bow, the same level of preservation goes for Hornet's flight deck itself, which looks like it did in 1942, with the addition of rust anyway. Now, beneath that mount, you can also see something fascinating. Well, two somethings, if you count another glimpse at just how deeply Hornet is buried in the mud, even this far forward. But in this case, I was referring to her anchor chain. Her port anchor chain, in specific, had a cable attached during Northampton's last attempt at towing Hornet, and you can still see the anchor chain extending out into the gloom. That image, of the anchor chain stretching out, is a sign of her final hope at survival. A great lost chance. And a historical insight that you rarely see. With that done, however, that leaves two things left on the hull that I want to make special note of. First, shell holes are visible here and there. The shell holes are almost certainly remnants of the 400 or so 5-inch rounds that American destroyers pumped into her to try and scuttle Hornet after the towing efforts were abandoned. And, secondly, perhaps the most famous image to come out of Hornet's wreck. That being a view into her hangar, where an International Harvester aircraft tug sits, upright and resting in place. This is quite possibly the best preserved bit of equipment on any of these deep water wrecks. The seat is still in place, the tires remain intact, and even the white paint on the International Harvester name is still there. One can make an argument that the planes around Lex are in better shape, and I wouldn't say they're wrong, but there's something about the image of this tug that is so special. As if one could clean it up and happily drive it across the hangar of CV-12 or something. The chain hanging in place in front of it is another interesting sign of preservation while we're on the topic of these pictures. That being intact at all is impressive. Being intact and still in place after her sinking and over three quarters of a century underwater? That's even more impressive. The darkness behind the tug of Hornet's hangar makes me hope that a follow-up expedition sends an ROV inside to see what else remains in there. In any case, that brings us to an end on Hornet's hull. I'll briefly look at a couple parts of her debris field, though this is less expansive and interesting than Lexington's. Likely because, broken stern aside, Hornet is in better condition than Lexington. To begin, there's her signal bridge, as mentioned earlier. This rests off on its own, with the paint still visible and more or less intact. Considering the fact it fell away on its own, this is impressive. Equally impressive, though far smaller, is a wash kit right down to the toothbrush resting in the mud beside it. That's a humanizing touch to the wreck, just like similar finds in the debris field of the Titanic. The kind of thing you instinctively know is aboard this ship, as men lived and fought aboard her, but that you don't expect to see, not miles down, and after nearly 80 years at the time the picture was taken. But I'm sure more people are interested in the wildcat mentioned earlier in the video. Well, I'm sorry to say that isn't quite as well preserved as the planes off Lexington. While the paint is still visible, it is far more faded than on the other planes. The Hornet Wildcat is also missing its tail. Still, the plane is pretty well preserved, all things considered. With that, though, we come to the end of the video. Hornet is an interesting wreck to look at because of just how intact she is, battle damage aside. Her level of preservation is arguably better than Lexington, on top of being in a more intact state to begin with. It is much tougher to say which is better preserved between the sunken Yorktown sisters, though, due to a lack of quality pictures of Yorktown. Hopefully, whenever someone inevitably goes hunting for Hear You and Soar You off Midway, they take a detour and give us an update on Yorktown, to compare her to Hornet with modern pictures. At the moment, I'm debating between Wasp and Hermes for the next shipwreck video. We'll see. Maybe even an Atlantic wreck like Bismarck or SMS Scharnhorst. Before I round this off, though, a quick note. It's important to note, here at the end, that Hornet's exact location was not disclosed by Petrol. This is something they never did, specifically to protect the wreck sites. Now, Hornet is deep enough that she should be safe regardless, 
But the point remains. The only way to find Hornet is to repeat what Petrol did, as I noted at the start of the video, with the added hurdle of doing it without cooperation from the United States Navy. So Hornet is perfectly safe from Rex salvagers for all intents and purposes. Hornet is far safer than Rex in Indonesian waters. She is much, much deeper, much more expensive to reach, and her exact location remains hidden. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.